I'm going to invite you to take your Bibles or your Bible apps and turn to the Gospel of John chapter 1. Gospel of John chapter 1 is where we're going to begin our study. You also may want to flip over and find 1 Corinthians 12. We're going to visit that one as well. Uh, if you don't have a Bible with you or an app on your device, that's fine. Grab uh, one of the Bibles in the seats around you. Turn to page 1052. It's not actually where John 1 is, but it's right next door to it because John 1 doesn't have a number on the page. Uh, but uh, you'll find John chapter 1, page uh, 1139. You'll find uh, 1 Corinthians 12. And uh, by the way, if you need a Bible, you want to read God's Word, you don't have a Bible, then take one of these with you. It's our gift to you. We want you to have the Bible because we know that if you read God's Word, it will change your life. We are uh, in the second or third week, actually, of our Purpose Driven Life, What on Earth Am I Here For series. And last week we talked about our very first purpose, that we were created to worship. And today we're going to talk about a concept that we're going to call fellowship. Fellowship. Uh, now, uh, fellowship is a, a definitively church word. We use it uh, in church all the time. Uh, and if, but let me ask this. How many of you grew up in, in church on a regular basis? Okay, lots of hands go up. Uh, lots of you didn't raise your hand, which means you may not be familiar with the word fellowship. But, uh, but I grew up in church world, and so I understood the different contexts for fellowship. I mean, fellowship would be used for the coffee and donuts time before Sunday school. As in, we're going to spend a little time in fellowship, uh, which might eat into the, the, like, half the Sunday school time. But that was okay, because we like the donuts better. And, uh, or it might mean a church potluck. And, uh, you know, if you didn't grow up on church potlucks, then it's kind of a combination of an all-you-can-eat buffet and the Food Network show Chopped. Uh, because <clears throat> you never know what the mystery ingredients are in the dishes, because there's not labels with ingredients all spelled out and everything. And so uh, being someone who was kind of picky, uh, but who liked food a lot, I would kind of like, you know, wander the thing going, nope, 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 don't have a clue what that is. Uh, I would hang out with the fried chicken and the macaroni and cheese, because that's safe, right? You know, and the dessert table, because uh, you're willing to take your chances for chocolate. Uh, or... Fellowship meant uh, the party after the Sunday night service uh, that we were too holy to call a party. So we called it a fellowship. Uh, well, guess what? Those are not uh, what biblical fellowship is. Uh, biblical fellowship, which, by the way, the word is used in the Bible. In the Old Testament, fellowship usually refers to a type of offering that people would make in the temple. And in the New Testament, it talks about a relationship, a connection that that we are together in this commitment of following Jesus. That we are not alone on this journey, and we're not meant to take this faith journey alone. Uh, in essence, fellowship means that we were designed to belong. We were designed to belong. Uh, last week we talked about how we were created to worship God, and we we're also created to live in community with other believers. Uh, we know this because from the very beginning, in the Garden of Eden, before there was sin, when it was still perfect and it was paradise, God said to Adam, it is not good that the man should be alone. It's not good that the man should be alone. So he created a woman uh, so that they could uh, share life together, and he created the, the, what we call family. And then out of family, community was created. And then at, you know, when Jesus showed up, he created the church to be a family uh, as well. And so we, we see this in the story of scripture we see this in the pictures that scripture paints of who we are as followers of christ so if you're a follower of jesus if you believe that jesus is the one and only son of god and savior of the world you believe that he died on the cross to pay for your sins and was raised from the dead and you have made a commitment to follow jesus christ with your life then you are spiritually born into god's family you're spiritually born into God's family. John chapter 1, uh, verses 12 and 13. The apostle writes, But to all who did receive him, meaning Jesus, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor the will of man, but of God. So if you embrace Jesus as your Savior, then you are born spiritually into God's family. Now think about this, you were born into a physical family, and then you were born again into a spiritual family when you confessed Jesus as Savior. Now, just real quickly, there's a lot of people who throw around a, a very unbiblical statement when they're talking about people in this world, they say we're all children of God. 
that is not actually a biblical, biblically true. We're all created by God. We're all loved by God. We're all part of God's creation. But the children of God are those who are born by faith spiritually into the family of God when they confess Jesus Christ as Lord. That's why we celebrate baptisms. It's that declaration of birth that, hey, God has changed my life, and, and now I'm made new. I'm, I'm born into God's family. And you know what that means? Now that you're, you're born into the family of God, that means that we're related. Yeah, we're going to be related forever. And some of you are like, yeah, that is so cool. We're going to spend eternity together. That is awesome. I'm looking forward to it. And others of you are thinking right now, with him? <laughs> with her? I, I, don't, I don't like them. I don't want to be hanging. I, oh, man. Is, do they have to be there? Hey, they're your family. They're going to be there. And you might as well go ahead and learn to love them now. So get over it. Because here's my theory, and it's just a theory. It's not based in biblical facts, so don't, you know, don't say Pastor Chad said this is going to happen. This is just how twisted I am on the inside. I think if there's two Christians that, that really don't like each other, that uh, when you get to heaven, God's going to make you be roommates for the first 10,000 years. <laughs> just, just because I'm sick on the inside. But, you know, it's kind of like that whole parent thing, you know, when your kids are fighting, and you're like, okay, hug each other. All right, make up, you know, and, and you don't want to do it, but, you know, your parents make you. So that probably isn't going to happen, but that's just how I think. So we're spiritually born into God's family, and you belong to the body of Christ. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, I mentioned before, page 1139, if you want to flip over to it. The Apostle Paul says this, For just as the body is one, this is verse 12, For just as the body is one and has many members, and all the members of the body, though there are many, are one body, so it is with Christ. For in one spirit, we were all baptized into one body. And it doesn't matter what your background or what your status is and all that kind of stuff. What matters is that you're part of Jesus' body. And, and that means that all of us are members of Christ's body, which means that all of us are valuable and important to God. But you hear that, all of us, all, you are valuable and you are important to God because you are part of his body. You belong to the body of Christ. You see, I know this because all of uh, the parts of your body are important to you. Uh, you may not always like how they look and feel, but there is no healthy part of your body that you would willingly lose. And I know some of you right now are thinking, yeah, there's some fat I'd like to donate to science. But I don't think fat really counts as a member of your body. It's in there. It's an invader of some kind. Uh, you know, it's evil. But uh, you see, realistically, which finger are you willing to part with? Which hand do you want to give up? Which leg or arm or eye do you want to sacrifice without need? You see, every person who is part of Calvary is valuable and wanted. And it still drives me crazy that I can't know all of you. Okay, I'm just going to confess that. I, I, it, it is something where I, don't, I see you in the stores and I don't know your name and it just irritates me to my soul because I know that you've got these tremendous stories and I want to hear the stories and, and I want to learn how God's worked in your life and I want to get to know you and, and there just isn't enough time. And, and so, uh, it, but the offer is always there. Call up, let me take you to lunch and let me hear your story. Let's sit down and talk. Let me hear your story. But, uh, but here's the thing. That's why we push connection here because you really start to feel your value you start to feel how important you are when you connect to a life group or to a ministry because it's in that small group setting that people get to know you and you get to know people and you understand how significant you are in the life of the body of Christ and it becomes more important the bigger we get that the smaller we need to get See, the more people that show up here on the weekends, then the more important it is for us to have life groups and for you to connect to life groups because otherwise you can just be in the crowd and nobody can really know you and you're not really fitting in and feeling valuable to the body of Christ. So just know that when you confess Jesus as your Savior, you are spiritually born into the family of God and you belong to the body of Christ. So you are valuable, you're important, you're wanted. So we're designed to belong. So let's talk about attributes of biblical fellowship. Because we're talking about this concept of fellowship. But what does true community look like? 
because I belong to a lot of churches that had some extremely dysfunctional fellowship. You know, I, I kind of say a lot of times, you know, all families are crazy, and you hope that they're going to be crazy fun. Um, and, uh, and the same is true with churches. You know, it, it's a family of faith. They gather together, and some are healthier than others. And I've been a part of some really unhealthy churches. I've been a part of churches where they didn't trust anybody, especially anybody in leadership, because their leaders had betrayed them so many times through the years that they just looked at everybody as being a fraud. They, they really did. And that was no fun to serve on a team like that, on a church like that. And I've been in churches where they were very judgmental. And they had no problem attaching labels to people and disqualifying people and, and wanting to kind of shun people, keep them on the outside because of, of their past. And I've been a part of churches where gossip reigned and where hypocrisy was accepted as the norm. And those are not healthy places to be. And if you're like me and you've been in several churches, then you've probably at some point, you know, have left a church with pain in your life. And, and, and if that's the case, I'm really glad you're here and giving us a chance to uh, let God redeem that. But here's the reality. If we're going to belong, then we want to belong to a church that is healthy and joyful and has biblical fellowship. And that can happen. But it only happens when we as individuals and we as families and we as life groups embrace this idea of biblical fellowship and the attributes of biblical fellowship and we live them out in our lives. We live them out in our families. We live them out in our life groups. And then Calvary, the church, reflects that biblical attributes of fellowship. So let's talk, uh, talk about the four essential attributes of biblical fellowship, if you will. This is what we want Calvary to look like, your life groups to look like, uh, your family to look like. Uh, the first attribute, authentic. We, want, we think biblical fellowship is authentic. In Ephesians chapter 4, the Apostle Paul says this. He says, rather, speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in every way into him who is the head, that is Christ. Hear that again. We are to be speaking the truth in love and growing up into Christ, maturing into Christ. And, and, and you can't do one without the other. So part of maturity is speaking the truth in love. And that means being truthful about who we are. Now, see, a lot of people want to, uh, you know, a lot of churches, just honestly, that talking about truth and love, a lot of churches do the truth part, and they kind of leave out the love part. Well, we're going to tell you the truth whether you like it or not. We're just going to hit you over the head with it as a hammer, and, and they're just kind of mean. There's not a lot of people who like being around mean people except other people who are mean. And then there's other churches that kind of take that whole love part, and they kind of leave off the truth part, and they kind of go, hey, we're just going to love everybody, and we're just going to comfort you and encourage you and affirm you and whatever, and, and, uh, and, and we'll be nice to you while you're going to hell. <laughs> if we're going to be authentic, then we need to have truth, and we need to have love, and they need to be there together. And, and if we're going to be truthful, then we want to start by being truthful about us, about who we are. Because if you can't tell the truth about yourself, then you have no business telling the truth to anyone else. And that, that means that we're going to be real. We're going to be authentic. We're not going to be fake. We're not going to encourage fake. We're not going to uh, embrace fake. And that challenges us to stop pretending and to stop hiding. And, and parents, let me just say this. Uh, if you want your children to grow up and love Jesus and follow Jesus and serve Jesus and him be the focus of their life, then you've got to be authentic in your faith at home. Your faith can't be just something you do an hour during the week. It's got to be something that you live day in and day out. That's what authentic is. And, and that, so that challenges us to stop pretending that we've got our life together and hiding our flaws and our, our pasts and, and all our mistakes. And, and honestly, I know there's some people who are avoiding life groups because when you join a life group, there's nowhere to hide and people get to know you and they get to know your story and then you think that that's going to be a bad thing because you're afraid they're going to judge you. There's some of you that go, I'd like to have lunch with Pastor Chad, but I, they need to ask me questions. Yes, I would. And, uh, and you're afraid that uh, if I hear your story that I won't like you. But the truth is, we're not going to judge you. Now, I realize it does happen in churches where you share in your story, and some churches are going to judge you. But let me just tell you, let me remove that fear. That's not going to happen here at Calvary. 
We're not going to judge you. It doesn't matter what your story is. Uh, it doesn't matter what, where you've been through, what you've done. We're not going to judge you because we know that we are just as messed up as you are. I mean, that, that's our reality. We understand that. In fact, the Bible, if, if you're offended because I just said you're messed up, the Bible says it, okay? It uses the word sinner instead of messed up, so use whichever one you like. But for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. There is no one righteous, not even one, is what Scripture affirms. And so we all know that we're in the same place of being strugglers, of being people who fail. We've got scars in our past. We've got mistakes in our past. And some of the past is like yesterday. And so we're here looking for hope. And I want you to know that, that you can just stop wasting your energy pretending. Or trying to hide. Just embrace the grace of God and tell the truth about yourself. Confess your weaknesses, confess your failures, so that we can pray with you and encourage you. You see, healthy fellowship tells the truth about ourselves, and, and that's that confession and then forgiveness and love kind of process. Because that's what happens when we're honest about ourselves and we experience the grace of God, we receive forgiveness from Him from the family of God because we're not lying anymore to each other and, and then we get to love each other because we're telling the truth. Unhealthy fellowship tells the truth about others. You're messed up. Not I'm messed up and come join us, but you're messed up and so it, it begins to, to accuse and judge and condemn others. We want to be biblical. Biblical fellowship is authentic and biblical fellowship is reciprocal. I know it's kind of a weird word to use, reciprocal, but uh, it works. The Apostle Paul in Romans 12 said, Rejoice with those who rejoice and weep with those who weep. Meet people at their point of need and take care of them. If you read the Bible, especially the New Testament, you're going to find there are a world of one another's in Scripture. A whole bunch of one another's. Uh, we're challenged to love one another, encourage one another, pray for one another, be kind to one another, forgive one another, help one another, serve one another, and a whole bunch more. Uh, in fact, it's summed up best by Jesus in uh, Matthew 7 when he said this, as you wish others would do to you, so you are to do to them. You know, it's called the golden rule, right? So whatever you wish that others would do to you, do also to them. Matthew 7, 12. Pretty simple. A lot of you knew the golden rule. You just didn't know it started with Jesus. And, and so now you know. That's the source. So when people quote that, go, hey, you like Jesus too? That's cool. Uh, so the golden rule, healthy fellowship means that we take care of other people. Now notice what the golden rule didn't say. It didn't say, as other people do to you, do back to them. Because see, that's revenge. And that's where a lot of us go. Are you treating me that way? You want some of that? I'll give you back to you. No, Jesus says, as do the right thing. Treat them the way that you want to be treated, not the way they're treating you. Uh, and, and, and what that does is it means that we're going to take care of each other because there is a biblical truth that applies to all of us no matter where we live and how we live, and that is this. You're going to reap what you sow. We're going to reap what we sow. We can't escape that. And, and, and hopefully that's good because we're going to sow the good stuff because we're going to live a reciprocal life. And, and, and that means that if we practice kindness... What are we going to receive back? Kindness. And, and if we practice generosity, how are people going to be towards us? Yeah, generous. And if we practice serving, will other people meet our needs? <laughs> that one always gets quieter. <laughs> Three services and it gets really quiet. And, and here's the thing. It's really tough for us to trust God at that point and, and really go, hey, I'm going to be a servant and, and I'm going to take care of other people's needs and I'm going to trust God to take care of my needs through other people. But see, that's what happens when we say, hey, I'm going to live this reciprocal life. I'm going to rejoice with those who are celebrating. I'm going to cry with those who are grieving. And I'm going to pour into myself into people the way that God has called me to. Because I'm going to reap what I sow, I really am going to do unto others as I want them to do to me. So if we practice love, what comes back to us? Yeah. You see, we want those things in our life. We want kindness and generosity and service and love. And so that means we need to be those people to those in need. In short, bless others and you yourself will be blessed. That, that's the message of Scripture over and over and over again. So if you're going to bless others, don't just bless those that are close to you. Don't just bless your family and the, your close friends and the people that you like. 
Bless everybody. People that irritate you, that took your parking spot on your way into church, bless them. Bless the people who drive differently than you. Bless the people in the, in the grocery stores that, you know, are standing there blocking the aisle. Bless, just bless them. And, 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 and I'm saying that in all sincerity because if you live your life trying to bless others, then you're going to embody the ethic of Christ. And if you start in your homes, in your families, it'll be transformative everywhere else. So biblical fellowship is authentic, it's reciprocal, and it's healing. Biblical fellowship is healing. James chapter 5, the apostle says, Therefore confess your sins to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. Confess your sins to one another, pray for one another so that you may be healed. The church of Jesus is to be a healing place. A place where, where those who are broken and hurting and damaged and wounded can find safety and comfort and healing. Uh, I heard it put this way once. The church is a hospital, not a courthouse. Uh, it should be a place of healing, not a place of condemnation. A place where loving relationship comes before uh, the rebuke. So I think of it this way. If someone is drowning and you are there, does that person need to be rescued or do they need to be offered swimming lessons? <laughs> yeah, but which do they need first? See, they need to be rescued first. And, and uh, you know, if you're there saying, hey, uh, you're in trouble and you got in over your head, that's not really helpful. They already kind of know that at that point. And too often, the church has been a courthouse, and when people are drowning, we simply go, hey, you know, you got in over your head, you shouldn't have done that, and if you'll come to our church on Tuesday night, we'll teach you how to swim. And that's not Jesus. That's not what Jesus does. What we need to do is we need to rescue. We need to bring people to safety. And we need to encourage them and let them heal. And then teach them. So after you're safe, we'll teach you how to swim. After you're safe, we'll teach you how to live your life with Christ. How to learn from the Bible. How to live in love. But first, we've got to be that place of healing. And by the way, if, if we're not safe, then no one's ever going to confess their sins and admit their weaknesses. Um, you see, this is why I love our Celebrate Recovery. Monday nights at 6.30, that's right, there's a lot of you that love it too. But Monday nights at 6.30, uh, we, at the McCulloch campus, we offer an opportunity for anyone who is struggling. And, and if you're thinking, well, yeah, I'm, I'm more messed up than the people around me, which probably isn't true. Uh, but, uh, but if you think that, then... Celebrate Recovery is a safe place for you to show up and learn how to, you know, face your struggles, face your hurts, your habits, your hang-ups, whatever it is that's keeping you stuck, and, and, and God can change your life. I encourage you to check it out because it is a wonderful place of healing. So biblical fellowship is healing, and biblical fellowship is forgiving. Forgiving. Again, the Apostle Paul Ephesians chapter 4 says, Be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another as God in Christ forgave you. Be kind. Forgive one another because God has forgiven you in Christ. See, when Jesus died on the cross, he paid for our sins, all of them. We're forgiven because of Jesus. And, and we didn't do anything to earn that forgiveness. He just gave it to us. And so uh, because we've been forgiven, what are we called to do? Forgive. We're called to forgive. That's that reciprocal thing again. And, and see, here's the thing. Without grace, we can't have healthy relationships. Without grace, we can't be authentic. We can't heal. Without grace, we really have no hope at all because, you know, we're all sinners. We already mentioned that. And, and without grace, we are bound for hell without hope. It is the grace of God that promises us heaven when we deserve hell. That's why Paul said, for by grace you have been saved through faith, that not of yourselves, it's a gift of God, not by any works, lest anyone should boast. So the reason that we can do what we're doing, the reason that we can celebrate and sing is because of God's grace. And all of us need grace. We need it from God because we're sinners, and we need it for each other because we're going to offend. So I don't know about you guys, but I will offend you. If you give me enough time. 
Okay? I, in fact, I need grace from you right now because I'm, I'm bound to offend you soon. And, uh, and I know this because God created me with, with uh, a tongue that's kind of fast. And, uh, and, and Scripture says where words are many, sin is not absent. So it's only a matter of time before I say something to offend you. So I need grace from you. And, and if it's not my words, then it'll be, I'll disappoint you some other way. And, and, uh, and so I'll need grace from you then, and, and uh, you know, maybe I'll forget your name. I already told you I would. Uh, you know, I'll be out in the grocery store, and I'll be thinking, I know them, I know them, I know them. What's their name? And, and sometimes I'll just go, I don't have a clue. Just tell me. I know you, some of you are watching me with delight, kind of going, <laughs> he doesn't know my name. <laughs> but he's trying to remember my name. I told it to him once. Uh, so, uh, Yeah. So I'm going to offend you. I, you know, I won't show up for a, a, an occasion you invite me to or something. And so I need your grace. I hope you'll give it to me. We all need grace from one another. And, and grace changes the dynamic of all of our relationships. When we give freely the grace that we've received from God, it just changes everything. But you know who really needs your grace? Your spouse. Your spouse needs your grace. Sometimes we're the harshest on the people who are closest to us. And you need to give them your grace. You need to offer them forgiveness and mercy. You know why? Because they live with you. <laughs> Remember that part about looking in the mirror and kind of, you know, seeing yourself being true about that? You know who else needs your grace? Your children need your grace. I know you have high expectations for them. And I know you, you expect great things for them. But they need your grace. Your parents need your grace. Your friends need your grace. Biblical fellowship is forgiving fellowship. We need to be the grace place. You see, that's the kind of church we want to be. A, a church that is authentic, reciprocal, healing, forgiving. But it's only going to happen if each one of us chooses to embrace biblical fellowship. Chooses to live it out in our own life and in our family's life and in our life group's life. And then it'll happen here. And then God will do amazing things. You see, real biblical fellowship is appealing to people. And if we model the love and compassion of Christ, we will draw people to Jesus. It will happen. We know this because of what Jesus said. John 13, Jesus said, By this all men will know that you are truly my disciples if you have love for one another. Let's be his disciples and let's do biblical fellowship. Will you pray with me?